κύριε Γρήγορα, είμαι εδώ. Ανδρέα, νομίζω είμαστε όλοι. Εντάξει, δώσε. δώσε δύο λεπτά. Οκ. Okay. Δώσε δύο λεπτά. Κάνω <coughs> και. City Center, Miss Lisa Ruth, City yes. International Group, right? Am I right? That's right. correct. Right. I don't want to make a mistake about that. <laughs> uh, during, uh, when I will introduce you, you know. Right. Perfect. I will not. Uh, I will not say details about. Uh, a lot of details about the previous uh, <laughs> career uh, in the agency, right? Yeah you, yeah, you could say some basic. Yeah, that's fine. Basic, basic. Some, ba some basic is good for the conversation also. Of course. Uh, I'm here. Δεν με βλέπει. Σε βλέπει. Δεν πρέπει να σε βλέπω. Δεν πρέπει. Κλείνουμε άμεσα. Α, με έκλεισε. Όλη μέρα να σε βλέπω. I see you. All day. See you later. All day. Next week too. So, we will start in two minutes. I wish that everybody you have uh, check your micro microphones and uh, uh, your camera. Everything is working. Check, Miss Ruth. Check, Charles. Check. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Miss Mieli, is you, you are good. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right, and uh, Miss uh, Mr. Grivas, we are good. Okay. Uh, thanks, okay. Mr. Rizvi, it's not here. Mr. Rizvi. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Rizvi is here. Mr. Is here. Sign in. Yes, Mr. Rizvi, do you hear? Right. Yeah, I can. I can. Can you hear me? I can. Mr. Howard. Only Mr. Rizvi. Yes, Mr. Howard. Bravo. Thank okay. you very much. Welcome, Howard. Welcome, Joy. Yes, uh, this is Osama Rizvi. Can you hear me all? I, we can hear you, but we cannot. We cannot see you. Yeah, you'll be able to see me in about two minutes. Uh, let me turn right. on my uh, video as well. Okay. All right. All right. Check your video, and we'll start in a, in a very, very. In a minute, we will start. All right. Uh, right. <coughs> Born in Alabama, growing in Virginia. How's that? From the south to the center. That's good. That's good. Virginia. Good. So, 
We can see Mr. Rizvi. And Not we're yet. starting. Not yet. Right. Right. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes, yes. Very good. All right. So we're all here. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So welcome, everybody. Uh, dear panelists, uh, dear uh, uh, friends, welcome to the, our second day of uh, this Electronica Forum, first international uh, AHEPA Forum, uh, which is established from, by the AHEPA Chapter 41 in Thessaloniki, Calamaria. Uh, welcome for uh, the today moderator will be uh, Miss uh, Lisa Ruth. Uh, Lisa, Lisa, Miss Lisa Ruth was born in Alabama and grew up in Virginia. Her father worked in uh, NASA, right? Am I right? I have good information. That's correct. That's correct. And, uh, and also he works for uh, for the agency. Let's say agency. Um, <laughs> you, he, Miss uh, Lisa Ruth. Uh, um, after graduating with a master's degree in major international relations from the University in Virginia, recruited in uh, uh, CIA, and he spent there for uh, spent more than 16 years in uh, several places around the world. We're talking about uh, North Africa, Middle East, Asia. Uh, I miss something. Latin America. <laughs> Europe, Europe, and of course, United States. Uh, current Miss uh, Lisa Ruth, uh, our moderator for today, is the CEO of uh, for <clears throat> if uh, the CEO of uh, International Group CTC INC. Am I right? CTC That's International right. Group. All right. right. Thank you very much that you have you for today. Thank you very much that you accept to be our moderator for today, and mm -hmm. I will pass the floor to you. And I hope I wish everybody a productive uh, uh, conversation for today. Uh, be aware that uh, our forum, our today, um, our today conversation is recorded, uh, and uh, we will upload uh, the result to YouTube. I will send you the link to everybody, and everybody will receive the link to what's happening. So, uh, thank you very much again. Welcome, and I hope that you. I'm sure that you will enjoy. Uh, this uh, conversation. Thank you very much. The thank floor you. is yours, Ms. Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. We are, I'm very excited to be part of the panel today. We have four very distinguished guests. We have Dr. Charles Alinas, who is the CEO of EC Cypress Natural Harbor Hydrocarbons Company. We have Rebecca Miele, who is a geopolitical and homeland security analyst. She is currently the head of the Israeli office of Italia Atlantica. We have Konstantinos Grivas, who is associate professor of Hellenic Military Academy, Department of Turkish and Modern Asian Studies at the University of Athens. And we have Syed Mohammed Osama Rizvi, who is a crude oil analyst, economic and geopolitical analyst, and an advisor and consultant. I very quickly want to go over, each panelist will have seven minutes to deliver their opening remarks, after which we will have questions, and then we will have closing remarks. Uh, if there's any questions from the panelists at this time, please let me know very quickly, and otherwise we will proceed and get started. I want to start with Dr. Charles Alinas. Uh, he is going to discuss the energy situation in the Mediterranean EU, uh, in the Mediterranean and the EU, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Alinas has over 35 years experience in the oil and gas sector in senior management positions. He is currently, as I said, the CEO of ECNHC, which is EC Cypress Natural Hydrocarbons Company. And he, prior to this, he was CEO of Crytek. Did I say that right, Dr. Alinas? Crytek. Critique. 
uh, responsible for implementing Cyprus government strategy for the development of its hydrocarbon sector. He was previously director of Mott McDonald for 25 years and the managing director of Mott McDonald's oil, gas, and petrochemicals business worldwide. He's also an editor, a writer, and is part of the Atlantic Council. Uh, Dr. Alinas, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. It's a, an interesting event. I will concentrate on the issues to do with uh, the impact of uh, coronavirus COVID-19 on East Med gas. The, this has led to the cancellation of drilling for gas in, in the whole of the East Med, but has also affected the development of gas projects in general. The global gas industry was in trouble much before COVID-19 due to overproduction of gas and LNG, particularly from the United States of America. The pandemic made it more difficult. The economies of all countries in the East Med have been affected by COVID-19 and recovery will be challenging. So in Cyprus, ENI and Total and ExxonMobil all uh, were doing exploration. We were planning to do more drilling this year. They have all postponed it to 2021, but with the proviso that they will do it if conditions allow it. Noble, Delek, and Shell plan to review the Aphrodite development plan. Aphrodite is a gas field discovered in Cyprus that tried to develop it and is running into problems. In Egypt, the LNG plant Irku has not exported any LNG since March due to low global prices and the production from the well-known major uh, Zor gas field has been reduced to about half of capacity. And ENI and Shell have stopped drilling. In Lebanon, the first well drilled by Total did not find gas and uh, no announcement has yet been made about when drilling will restart. In Turkey, uh, Turkey is taking advantage of this situation. Turkey is still drilling in Cyprus EZ and is persisting with its uh, East Med dominance plans, clearly showing that there is no economic basis to these actions. The, let me talk to, tell you a little bit about the state of the international oil companies. The oil and gas sector is in crisis worldwide. The first quarter uh, of 2020 results show massive reductions in profits and in some cases uh, losses. Shell was forced to reduce its dividend by a third for the first time since uh, World War II. ENI's profits were slashed by 94%. And ExxonMobil made a $610 million loss for the first time in 30 years. On the, as a result of this, the IOCs have reduced their spending this year by 20 to 50%, and more will follow next year. There is a lot of restructuring and consolidation taking place, and recovery is not expected to happen uh, and, and, uh, that soon. It may take two to three years. The IOCs are going for large projects, easy to develop, with high returns. Where this is not the case, they are looking into divesting assets. Sadly, ESMED does not fit into this. The global markets have, are also in trouble. There was already, as I said before, a glut of LNG in markets uh, in 2019 that kept prices low. Competition with renewables is also a major factor. COVID-19 and its devastating impact on the global economy and energy demand and the oil price collapse brought gas and LNG prices down to about $2 per million BTU. It has never been that low ever. Too low to even recover costs. And yet more LNG is coming into the market. Over the next uh, five to seven years, something like 180 to 190 million tons of new LNG is coming into the market, either through projects already under construction or projects for which a final investment decision has already been made. About 50 of that is coming from Qatar LNG, the cheapest LNG in the world. The demand over this period is only going to increase by 100 to 150 million tons. That means that this excess, this oversupply of LNG 
is going to continue for the whole of this decade. And that uh, is making it very difficult for the ISMED gas to secure sales in global markets because it's expensive. The future of this gas is, is local. And there are, as I said before, there are also environmental factors. Um, Europe, Europe, with Europe in the lead, um, renewables are steadily increasing and the world is becoming greener. The European Union's Green Deal uh, will start impacting gas demand by the mid 2020s. EU does not need any new gas supplies. This MED has abandoned the renewable resources, but is not developing them properly. The EU should be encouraging their development rather than supporting gas exports that have little or no future. The energy future of these MED countries should rest on maximizing the development of renewables and expo exploiting gas resources regionally, not looking for exports. This requires a resolution of regional problems and hopefully the EU will act as a catalyst in this. So I will skip one or two things because we, are in a, uh, we don't have enough time, but I will tell you that in Cyprus, uh, the most advanced gas export option is through the development of the Aphrodite gas field. It's transport by pipeline to ITQ uh, LNG in, it, in Egypt, liquefaction and export, but this is facing cost challenges. And uh, Noble Energy and Delec, the developers, are facing dire financial problems. They are planning to reconsider the development of Aphrodite. In terms of hydrocarbons exploration, Cyprus is a frontier area with no infrastructure and expensive to develop. Drilling, as I said before, is, is likely to be developed, uh, to be delayed, but possibly also beyond 2021. And um, uh, 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 um, Jonathan Stern, the founder, uh, Professor Jonathan Stern, the founder of Oxford Institute of Energy Studies, said last week, I was very dubious about East Med Gas even before uh, COVID-19. Now, forget it. So it's, it's getting very serious. In Egypt, COVID-19 uh, has also had an impact. The, um, as a result of low gas prices globally, uh, it cannot export LNG from its ITCO LNG plant. It has been shut since March. This has forced the reduction of gas production with Zor gas field producing only half of its capacity. Any and Shell have stopped drilling, uh, but plans for further exploration are now shelved and maybe they have to wait until after 2021 when reco recovery happens. I will say a few things about the famous East Med gas pipeline because it's back again in the news. Every now and then it comes and creates furor. This has a strong political support from Israel, from Greece and Cyprus, but not Italy yet, where the gas will be landing and their support is needed. Also very strong support from the US and the EU is funding the studies. It has access to gas but its future is down to securing buyers in Europe to pay the price that makes its pipeline commercially viable. The EU is committed to the, uh, Europe has access to much cheaper Russian and Norwegian gas and cheap, flexible US LNG imports. The EU is committed to the Green Deal and is shifting to renewables. Prices in Europe are too low um, and even though this may increase, they will not reach the seven to eight dollars per million BTU needed to make this pipeline viable. This, uh, this uh, pipeline needs to secure gas sales, otherwise, otherwise it won't happen. And to conclude, I, I just have a few words to say about unlocking ISMED's future. So this, we, first of all, the ISMED needs to take a more realistic view of the future of its gas. Greece and Turkey can give the lead in rapprochement. Post-COVID-19, both countries must, must lift their economies, which are in dire trouble. They can do this only yes. by eliminating conflict through negotiations. Such a development could also help Cyprus concentrate on solving the Cyprus problem, the couple from unrealistic energy aspirations. Israel can benefit from developing its gas resources for its domestic market. Lebanon needs to get into grips with its economic problems, and Egypt's aspiration to become 
the regional gas hub is a distraction. Priority should be given to domestic energy market and renewables. For the for Eastmed gas, the future is local and regional markets. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alinas. I appreciate that. And we will come back for questions. Um, next, we're going to hear from Rebecca Mieli, who's an international security, homeland security and defense policy analyst. She has a particular interest regarding Middle East area and conflicts inside the region. She worked as a journalist and analyst both in Italy and Israel, dealing with topics such as terrorism, jihadism, and radicalization. She has written about nuclear and deterrent strategy, CBRN threats in the Middle East, with particular reference to Iran's nuclear ambitions, economic intelligence, and conflicts in the fifth domain. Rebecca, thank you for joining us today as well. Thank you for the introduction. It's an honor for me to attend a conference with such high-level actors and experts. Um, as I was saying that Middle East is undoubtedly one of the most unstable and unique regions in the world. Um, it has been extensively hit by COVID. Uh, in fact, despite a low rate of mortality, uh, the virus created new opportunities for jihadism. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important to stress out that the crisis triggered by COVID uh, affected every economic sector in the region. Uh, the global drop in oil consumption caused the collapse of the prices and economic damage, of course, to all oil producing countries. Uh, and countries that really um, heavily rely on tourism, for example, Israel or Egypt or Jordan are suffering from the tourism freezing. Uh, and we also have countries that are affected by political instability, like Lebanon, Iraq, Syria. Uh, they're about to face turmoils and disorders. Uh, and I would also like to say that the strongest leaders of the region uh, are about to losing their popularity. Iran, which is the country that faced the highest number of deaths, uh, fear that sign of weakness might endanger the regime. Um, jihadist groups around the world framed COVID-19 uh, as a geopolitical opportunity. And this opportunity did not result in equal actions or statements for all jihadist groups. For example, uh, when the pandemic didn't yet reach the Muslim majority areas, extremists framed it as a divine punishment against the infidels. Uh, Islamists in Africa used the, the virus outbreak to recruit and radicalize fighters. Uh, and we also have groups such as Hezbollah that exploited uh, the humanitarian vacuum to gain everyday more power by increasing aid to the population. Um, so Hezbollah, such as many other terror organizations, is using the failure of the states, the lack of medical, water, and food provision to build popular support to its cause. Uh, violent Islamist group exploited the situation even through conspiracy theories. They blamed the West, Jews, Zionists, China, of course, that persecuted the Muslim minority, um, everything that is just to be uh, enemy of Islam. Um, this conspiratorial strain has also been promulgated by state actors. For example, Iran, uh, where many senior figures in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps um, described COVID-19 to be a Zion Zionist biological terror attack. To ISIS, <clears throat> the pandemic represents a divine intervention to punish infidels. We all know that COVID didn't just target health. COVID-19 targeted Western lifestyles in a way never seen before. Just think about economic crisis, traveling interruption, social distancing. Um, all Western symbols had been targeted. Uh, and for all these reasons, the West came into panic, to terror. Terror group as ISIS could see in the Western crisis the opportunity to attack while all uh, national resources are implemented to fight pandemic. Um, of course, in all our countries, security forces are committed to public safety and the emergency is absorbing the attention of the, the society. Uh, and also the closure of the border and the, all the restriction on personal freedom have uh, deeply negatively affected the psychology and moral of the citizens uh, born and raised in, in libertarian and, and environment. So we, uh, could maybe face a scenario where the West 
um, it's no longer considered something invincible by terrorist group. Uh, at the same time, uh, classic terror attack scenarios will change probably uh, because, for example, concerts, big public events, all the demonstration, any kind of gathering is forbidden for now. So ISIS terrorist uh, terror attack um, uh, will change, uh, adapting to a new post-COVID scenario. Um, uh, ISIS uh, demonized the West, accusing it of spreading the virus, but they take advantage for this, from this situation in order to implement a new strategy. Uh, such negative conditions represent a unique opportunity to recruit and to attract desperate people within their ideology and propaganda. Uh, so the exploitation of the pandemic could possibly strengthen the faith among the believers and increase the antagonistic feeling against the West. Uh, Hezbollah approach, uh, I will be quick, uh, it's completely different because Lebanon is facing an extensive economic crisis and since Hezbollah is part of the government, it's perceived too as one of the costs of the economic crisis. Um, so now their main purpose is to take control of the Lebanon in order to gain everyday um, international uh, legitimacy. And the only way to achieve this goal for Hezbollah is uh, fill the void left by the state. So they will probably use the crisis to increase, uh, um, to increase their governance capabilities to help the, the citizen. Um, just like Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, the terror group in Gaza, uh, was forced to respond to the humanitarian vacuum uh, and I, re I read recently that the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank uh, believed that Hamas is using the coronavirus crisis to gain support within the West Bank. So, uh, in conclusion, um, terrorism that emerged in crisis scenarios or spaces where government is perceived to have failed, uh, it's emerging right now with the pandemic. The pandemic is likely to lower people's sense of trust in authority. And for this reason, we all need to uh, look at Al-Qaeda, ISIS, its affiliated Bolamas, and even far-right terrorism with a lot of attention since the pandemic could be an opportunity to be exploited in many ways. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ms. Mieli. And we will come back with questions. Um, next, we have Konstantinos Grivas. As I mentioned, he's an associate professor of Hellenic military at the Hellenic Military Academy, Department of Turkish and Modern Asian Studies. He's also at the University of Athens. He is he, he has written several books, including in 2013, The Military Rise of China and the Geopolitics of War in the Middle East. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Grivas, and. I think you're going to speak on the Balkan, Mediterranean, Turkey, and the world. Is that correct? Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to, to thank the, the organizers for this uh, honorary invitation. Uh, before starting, I would like to ask uh, to preemptively apologize for my rusty, for my lousy English. Uh, however, uh, a long time ago, when I was uh, young, I had to give uh, a conference in Oberammergau, Germany, in a NATO school. So when I was very anxious, uh, I expressed uh, my concerns about my linguistic uh, skills to a friend of mine, then a colonel of the Hellenic army, and he told me, do not bother, the bad English is uh, the semi-official language of NATO. So you can consider my presentation as a NATO standard uh, presentation. Perfect. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, uh, the main point uh, of my, my presentation is that uh, we are in a transitional uh, period. It seems uh, that we, we are in a phase of a, a great change in the, in the international system, in the, uh, the natural of the, of the international system. Uh, from um, some, some kind of hybrid international system which uh, combined the remnants of the unipolarity, the unipolar moment of the United uh, States with an expanding multi multipolarity, it seems that we are going, uh, the, we are uh, 
uh, heading towards a new bipolarity. And this uh, bipolarity is produced uh, by the very unproductive, the very, I think, unwise uh, decision of the West, especially the, white, the United States, to double envelope, to, to, to make some kind of super containment uh, against both Russia and China. Uh, however, this, uh, this uh, strategy actually pushes the two great Eurasian countries into each other's arms. And uh, they, they is creating a very, very big uh, geopolitical mass of the combination of uh, China and, uh, and Russia, which uh, uh, is pulling other countries of, the, of Eurasia in her, uh, traje in her uh, trajectory. Uh, so uh, we can say that uh, uh, there is uh, this uh, this scheme, this uh, 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 this con construction is the preform of of a new uh, geopolitical en entity in the global system, which uh, we could uh, characterize it as the first multipower in history. In turn, the Western powers were, were also strengthening their ties in order to confront this, this rising uh, Eurasian multipower. Thus, uh, there is a tendency to go from this, uh, the current uh, multi, multipolar global system towards a bipolar one. And we had the impact of uh, the coronavirus, which uh, can be characterized as a geopolitical asteroid. And uh, this impact uh, drastically accelerated this uh, development, this transformation. In particular, it seems that the, the United States has chosen to, to toughen her stance on China, which in turn puts, pushes further China, actually obligates China uh, towards a strategic approach to Russia. So it is possible that we are in front of a new Cold War within the framework of a new bipolar international system. So, and in this under formation uh, potential bipolar international system, the, the region of the Eastern Mediterranean is as uh, exist is at uh, uh, at the point of contact between uh, where the, the two geopolitical tectonic plates of Eurasia and the oceanic one are meeting. So it is is a very a very critical uh, uh, critical uh, place. Uh, thus, we have to examine the antagonism, which is very very critical for us. The antagonism between Greece and Turkey within this framework of this new great game in the Eurasian chessboard. And the main characteristic of the antagonism between Turkey and Greece is that the two countries have completely different approaches to deal with this new situation. Namely, Turkey seems to develop into an autonomous Eurasian power in order to negotiate on the best of terms her position in this new international system. And for her part, the West, and especially the United States, seems to think that it would be a great loss for the Western geopolitical architecture if Turkey were fully integrated into this Eurasian multipower. Consequently, Washington and the European Union are trying to keep Turkey in Western architecture at all cost and are pushing Greece to make painful concessions to Ankara in order to appease her. And the main question is what Greece is going to do with this situation. And I think that we are doing the wrong strategy. In my humble opinion, Greece is too much predictable for the Western strategy. Athens has been fully and completely identified with the United States and the European Union, not as an ally, but as a passive and mindless component of the Western architecture. And in a very naive, in my opinion, way, the Hellenic political system expects to be rewarded for this discipline that reaches the limits of self-elimination. 
And of course, I strongly believe that this is a recipe for disaster. Also, I strongly believe that Greece uh, must act as a, an autonomous geopolitical actor and to become unpredictable in, in order to re renegotiate her position and function in the international system with her Western allies and partners. And I have to notice that Greece is much, much more important element for Western strategy that, than Turkey. However, in order to be able to take advantage of this value, she must convince West that uh, is not willing to sacrifice her national sovereignty to keep Turkey in the Western world. On the contrary, it is in our best interest that Turkey to be expelled from the Western world. And if Greece has to, to accept the opposite, it has to get very, very serious compensation. So uh, more or less, that's uh, I wanted to, to say that uh, the relationship between Greece and Turkey is a part of a greater game in a very, in a rapidly changing geopolitical environment. Of course, we could uh, discuss uh, other issues. For example, this new uh, global system and this new uh, Cold War has also a very important, very interesting military dimension. Uh, for example, the creation on, on behalf of uh, Russia, China especially, or even Iran, uh, new uh, paradigms of warfare and power, and the power projection, such as the notorious uh, at the access area denial bubbles uh, based on the, at the sea ballistic missiles or hypersonic cruise missiles or so on, and the effort of the United States to penetrate these bubbles with also new weapons or using uh, uh, new uh, doctrines and methodologies, such as uh, the multi-domain battle of the United States Army. Also, they can have dramatic applications in the uh, Turkish Hellenic uh, geographical confrontation system. But, uh, of course, this is another issue. I think this is, uh, is beyond uh, the scope of our conversation. That's all I would like to say. I hope to, to offer something to the conversation. And I would like to apologize again for my bad English. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rivas. And, of course, your English is far better than my Greek, so thank you. Uh, we are now going to hear from Mr. Riz. Rizvi, who's going to talk about the oil crisis, I believe. Um, Mr. Rizvi is an economic and geopolitical analyst based in Pakistan, and he has special focus on China and emerging markets. He has written for many, many publications, and he has appeared on television to discuss global ec economic, local economic, and sort of general strategic economic situations. He is also a writer and writes for oilprice.com as well as Seeking Alpha and other media outlets. Mr. Rizvi, thank you very much. Thank you so much. First of all, uh, let, me, let me express my gratitude for uh, being joined by such a distinguished uh, board of panelists. So I'm glad to be here. And secondly, uh, I'll not only talk about the oil crisis, but mm -hmm. also about the global economy and the way to its recovery, the possible way to its recovery. So first of all, starting with the oil prices, you know, oil, oil is one of the industries, oil and gas, that has been drastically affected by the COVID-19. Um, as other people here would know, we belong to the ONG industry, that uh, a demand reduction not seen since the World War II has occurred recently, that amounts to about 30 to 40% of the global demand. Uh, 40 million barrels per day. So there are three factors here. First of all, the plunging demand. Second, an unfolding humanitarian crisis. And third, a supply shock. You know, and the oil industry along with these things are facing other multiple issues as well. So with the future uncertain and demand, though recovering as we speak right now, but relatively weak, the oil industry faces a lot of challenges. So I'm going to focus on the challenges that, it's make it, that, is, that it is facing these days. Uh, so the, the strategy for the oil industry is to innovate, 
is to introduce structural changes without which you know many many companies will not only go bankrupt but you know will not be able to restart their businesses at all so a, a little historical perspective first of all uh, from 1990s to 2005 uh, the oil industry posted uh, a total return to shareholders uh, 15 times more than the s&p 500 right but after the in the in the consequent 15 years that it from 2005 to up till now uh, it dropped 7 percent low that uh, to that of the s p 500 you know and in one of the, there was a report by mckinsey released recently and in one of the severe scenarios there you know oil prices may recover to 50 to or 60 range but the chances of that occurring is very very low uh, so we we are the oil industry, the, the the observers, the analysts should know that we are stuck with this mid 25 to 35 and to a maximum point 40 ranges for 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 a you know good amount of coming years. However, you know I would like to point out few of the challenges that that the industry are facing. The first is that the oil demand we might see the oil demand peaking by 2030, and after that it will start to fall. You know, closely related is the reality of energy transition that seems to hold sway gradually. You know, there there are talk about um, decarbonization policies. There are talks about electric vehicles. There is policy support for these sort of things. Whereas the traditional uh, industry players, they face uh, they they are facing a sort of uh, backlash from the energy environmentalists and the energy um, analysts. So LNG and gas will remain relevant and decarbonization policies may spur innovation, subsequently expediting the transition. Such a declining demand trend along with energy transition can give OPEC plus or as the new organization has been formed, OPEC plus plus, which includes US and the other, other countries as well, a very tough time. They might have to rethink their uh, current strategy and they have to they have to come up with an exit strategy to the grunt production cuts because they can't go on forever right so the future of oil prices will therefore depend will therefore depend on on on, on the number and nature of scenarios that concerns demand and supply you know for instance the upstream industry where the process of restructuring and con consolidation can be seen at its most you know hundreds of other companies uh, which might be able to reform and reorganize themselves. They may they may form groups together, and they they they, they can be called you know basin masters or something of this sort. And refineries and associated supply chain links will be optimized uh, under the downstream sector. Under the downstream sector, uh, the mid under the you know the midstream the midstream companies and the agencies thereof will face headwinds because the demand is declining as I've explained in the beginning. Uh, the oil field services and equipment, uh, OFSE, you know, these will be dotted with technological acceleration, reconfiguration, and new partnership with customers. Uh, as prices are expected to remain range bound, as I've explained, the national oil companies in the Middle East especially, and those um, countries from the, that, that uh, you know, combined to form the OPEC, they might remain under hot waters as their revenue will be jeopardized with the prevailing conditions. Uh, we all know what is happening in Saudi Arabia these days. Their, the, the, the Prince MBS's plans to you know, revolutionize their economy and open up a new city and uh, to conduct its uh, national transformation plan. It all depends upon mainly upon the oil revenue and the oil revenue is decreasing every day. So while these, while these problems are still there and they ring alarm bells for the industry. There is, however, a silver lining and there are a few opportunities. And I'd like to you know, mention these as well. Uh, the companies which are facing these, uh, these, these, these new, new, newly formed issues and problems, they can you know, strategize and choose their portfolio. One of the things they can do is that reconsider their capital allocations. They can change their preferences. You know, these allocations might be done considering areas that give the highest returns. And second, stress, the stress should be given on reducing general and administrative expenses. Uh, there is also going to be a wave of new mergers and acquisitions and strategic thinking will play an important role in it. The sector should also consider becoming more tech savvy and employ artificial intelligence and other technologies to implement models, policies and strategies that might be valuable in these dynamic times. 
uh, one of the top priority should be integration in the supply chain and to standardize and simplify the process. This also goes with using the technology and the cost reduction that I've talked earlier. So with reduced demand and lingering effects of this pandemic, you know, it is going to be a bumpy ride for mainly for the oil producing countries and China and US and other great economies as well, because you know, most of the stock markets and um, they have quite a high wage of oil and gas companies in them. But with the right strategy and direction, companies can turn this current, uh, this current uh, crisis, sort of unfolding crisis into opportunity and they can consolidate. Uh, the second thing that I would like to talk about was the global economy. Uh, how much time do I have? I saw you missed the time. Seven not minutes? not much, but if you could do a, a few quick quick comments, that would be helpful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So regarding the global economy, there, you know, I'll just uh, give you the summary. There are three things that are going on these days. Uh, there, of course, there is a talk of recession, in fact, depression, and the airline industry, the retail sector. Everyone is going, um, you know, crazy these days. However, you know, to, to to differentiate a real recession, we can talk about three things. One is uh, the policy recession. Second is the real recession, which concerns the economy. And third is the financial crisis, which talks about the stock markets and everything. And if you look at the current uh, scenario, all all of the the conditions in under all of these rubrics, they're not very good. So we are seeing, and for instance, I myself, you know, I see a very serious policy crisis in the in the making. We can talk about geopolitics. We can talk about the current uh, trade war between Australia and China. We can talk about the Hong Kong bill. We can talk about uh, the China and US trade war, which was put on a hold, but it will resurface. And I, I've been saying this for the past three or four months that it will resurface because uh, given the economic conditions, China could not fulfill its promise of buying certain amount of billions of dollars of production in the US. So it will, it will resurface. Then the recent issue of India and China, the Ladakh border and and, and the concerning area, it is being resurfaced as well. So all of these things, they hint towards uh, a, rather, a, rather, a rather aggressive policy, an era of rather aggressive policy making uh, in the coming years. And with revenues falling and with uh, you know, populism and other such sort of things taking hold all around the world, I see that uh, post COVID, this coronavirus is going to change the world forever. Post-COVID world will not and never be the same. The emerging markets will <laughs> end up with a lot of debt, and uh, they will also, you know, the, the companies will go down. The the spending power, the wealth effect, the 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 the, the spending power of a common man has decreased a lot, many folds, and this is going to play. Um, this is going to have long-reaching consequences for the overall economy of that very country and also the world as well. So that is pretty much from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rizvi. Uh, we are now going to have some questions and I, I certainly have a few. We're gonna start with Mr. Rizvi, but I was wondering, does any of the other participants have questions before I ask mine? If not, I, I'm very curious, when you were talking about the oil situation, Mr. Rizvi, um, one of the wild cards is OPEC. How do you see OPEC dealing with the dropping demand? And are we going to see cuts in supply? Yes, first of all, the, there is no solution that OPEC has that can be put forward in order to solve the dropping, drop in demand, right? Mm -hmm. The demand has to come by itself. No matter how much you cut, no matter what strategies do you make, uh, you cannot in, you cannot spur the demand in the in the in the oil markets, right? So and and as I've explained, there is you know we might not see demand going back to the previous levels, pre-COVID nineteen levels for the coming two or three years. So here is the thing, as I've said, you know, OPEC they need to consider something beyond the production cuts. Mm -hmm. All right, they right now they have more than you know, have the, the, the largest production cuts uh, in history. However, this, is, this isn't going to help them. Oil prices have recovered, but this is only based on sentiments, not on fundamentals. The stock levels are still full. You know, there are ships mm -hmm. 
in, in, in the ocean carrying millions of oil, millions of barrels of oils, and nobody is going to take it because economies are just reopening. But who knows, there might be a second wave. What is OPEC's strategy for them? So I see OPEC in trouble in the coming months. And uh, for the demand to recover, there is no, there, we, we only have to wait. That is all. There is no solution to it. And OPEC, I have always said, needs an exit strategy. They need to devise a strategy, a policy uh, through which each of the member assumes a certain quota. However, these production cuts should be given such a shape that their overall revenue streams aren't affected as they're being affected these days. So they'll have to choose between one thing, either fall in revenue and let go of all the plans they are having and, uh, you know, jeopardize uh, political and social unrest or to continue vying for the market share and, you know, which isn't going to pay them in, in quite positively, but that is the choice they're going to make. They'll have to choose between one of these things. And then I had a question on the global economic situation. Where do you see the bright spots as we're looking ahead here, you know, sort of back end 2020 and into the 2021? Are there bright spots? Who's going to recover more quickly? Yeah, there are bright spots. For instance, credit spreads are all around the world. You know, you don't see such panic there, which means the investors are still uh, seeing that the prospects of finances are being available to them. And secondly, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, if you look at the history of pandemics, there, there, most of, almost all of them have been followed by a V-shaped recovery. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so we can hope for a V-shaped recovery or maybe a double U recovery, which is a double V, you know, we'll see a shoot right up and then we'll fall once again. This may be because of the policy crisis that I've talked about, the trade wars and other things, or due to a second wave. But uh, I see I see trouble for the US, not because due to that it has been affected quite uh, devastatingly by the coronavirus, but there were underlying problems mm -hmm. as well. And uh, you can see the unemployment rate is spiking every day. And according to some estimates, it, you know, it is it can be 30 million people can be unemployed in the coming few months. Uh, so I see that uh, the the Asian region it, it it might be it might recover sooner than the Western Europe, uh, given the fact that the overall impact of coronavirus has been a little less here as compared mm. to the other Western countries. So, for instance, in Pakistan, the number of deaths are still thirteen or fourteen hundred, um, and the number of total cases is sixty four thousand. But still, it has been three months, and compared to Italy, Spain, and other countries, UK. Uh, we are doing much better. So I think the ish and, and China, for instance, uh, people are talking about Chinese downfall, but they have just launched history's largest uh, stimulus uh, in the shape of 4 trillion yuan, which is $560 billion in the shape of interest rate uh, reduction, subsidies and tax uh, rebates and other, other things. So I think this region is going to do well, while the West uh, is going to face some serious problems. That is my opinion. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Rebecca Miele. I, we have a few follow-up questions there. I, you know, uh, we, in my previous life, we always used to joke that terrorist attacks often come at Christmas or other times when the world is not paying attention. Do you mm -hmm. see this as a high vulnerability time frame for terrorism because of the emphasis on COVID? Yes, I was stressed out that uh, the fact that um, <clears throat> uh, that all the society is concentrated on on COVID uh, could represent an opportunity for terrorists. Uh, otherwise, uh, we have to say that um, great events uh, like, for example, Bataclan situation, mm -hmm. a great event with many people are unlikely to occur during this month. Uh, so we need to uh, look at scenario in, in the long term. Uh, and absolutely, yes, uh, I think that they will, uh, that they will uh, exploit this uh, um, situation. Uh, we need to take uh, an eye on, uh, on terror group and how they uh, are managing the situation. And then 
as you said, the, the actual getting together is lessened, but internet has certainly picked up. And we know groups like ISIS have been very successful at, at exploiting social media and terrorism. How is that playing out? What are you seeing online from the terrorist groups? Uh, they are using the situation to uh, recruit people. And mm -hmm. this is the worst situation if we are speaking about ISIS. Uh, so uh, they are using mm, these uh, bad times uh, to recruit people, maybe desperate people, or to stress out that uh, West is uh, the evil, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, like for uh, for the situation. Uh, otherwise, they are um, advising uh, people uh, to take um, sanitary measures such as washing hands, such as uh, take the, the social distancing. So uh, it's it's half and half. Uh, they um, are using this situation both to recruit and then to preserve preserve uh, like their group and and their people. I'm also afraid uh, that the uh, terrorists saw that pandemic is a, far, a formidable enemy. Uh, they saw uh, that uh, the West is in trouble, that the West mm. uh, is in panic uh, because of the restriction on, the, on personal freedom. Uh, and, and I'm also afraid uh, about CBRN terrorism. Uh, because uh, terrorists now knew that uh, uh, they can use even one infected man to infect others. Uh, of course, this thing is, is, uh, is, is not something new, but um, they, can, they can do it now because they know that it will work, you know? So the use of pandemics or biological threats for terror purposes is a risk for all countries. And from a strategic perspective, uh, such an attack could be extremely dangerous. So what I wanted to stress out is that even, even uh, the biological terrorism or the rise of biological terrorism could be a scenario, could be a threat to, to everyone. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent point. Um, Mr. Grievous, I wanted to ask you a question. You made a comment that Greece's current strategy is, you said it's disastrous. Can you explain that a little bit in terms of the, the uh, situation you were talking about, about the, the two sides, the, the bipolarity? Mr. Grievous, are you there? Did we lose you? Forgive no? me. <laughs> you are uh, forgiven. <laughs> Uh, during time, times of change, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a curse to be predictable and uh, on the contrary, it's a very great virtue to be unpredictable. And uh, we are exactly in this very, very fluid uh, transitional historic peri period. So uh, Greece, uh, which uh, right now suffers uh, a full-scale uh, hybrid uh, attack uh, from Turkey, uh, has uh, to, to renegotiate uh, her position and function in, the, in NATO, in uh, the relations with the United States, the European Union, and more generally in uh, the, the Western uh, architecture. Uh, otherwise, there is uh, the risk that uh, uh, very strong uh, centers of power uh, within the Western uh, geopolitical uh, um, architecture, uh, they will uh, try to uh, to use uh, at least uh, some parts of the Hellenic uh, national sovereignty. Uh, they will offer, uh, in a sense, this uh, uh, this rights uh, to the Turkey in order to appease Turkey and to maintain Turkey uh, within, which is completely unpredictable right now, mm -hmm. uh, to, main, to, to, to keep it uh, in, uh, in the Western world. Uh, in my humble opinion, of course, this is a stupid strategy. I think that uh, Turkey uh, has been lost for the Western world. I think that it uh, uh, has, has chosen a, a very 
uh, so uh, uh, a road uh, without with, uh, without any strategic relations with uh, with uh, the Western powers. On the contrary, it seems that uh, manipulates uh, United States or and, and some other and the other and European countries uh, in order to promote uh, her uh, her agenda. But from the, uh, the Hellenic part of view, this strategy that uh, we remain almost uh, uh, flatline uh, in uh, in terms of geopolitical activity, we do not have relations with nobody, not even our allies, and we expect uh, to be rewarded for our uh, uh, non-existence. I think that it's it's uh, it's a very very stupid strategy. Thank you very much. That, that was helpful. Oh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Alinas, I, I am curious, you were talking about renewables and the need for renewables. How much political will are you seeing to move in that direction? Did we lose Dr. Alinas? I think that mute. Oh, please unmute uh, Mr. Alinas, uh, your microphone. Yeah. So let me start. I mean, there is uh, okay. resistance, political resistance. Uh, but let me take Egypt as an example. Egypt uh, was a skeptic, but um, uh, over the last two years, they built the largest solar power plant in the world, the two megawatt power plant. There is increasing tendency to move towards renewables, and there is uh, assistance from outside. Uh, the European Bank for Investment and Reconstruction, the BRD, um, has been funding projects and as a result the um, use of renewables has been increasing. So there is future and with the European Union now definitely moving in that direction through the Green Deal, um, we will be seeing over the 10 years um, a stronger move in, in, in the same direction, especially in Cyprus and Greece who are obliged to, through their membership of the EU to adopt the targets the European Union is setting for renewables. And um, in fact, to, to its credit, Greece is doing quite well in terms of adoption of renewables. Uh, Cyprus not as well, but I'm sure it will follow from behind. So this uh, political will will increase with time. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move to the closing uh, segment where everyone will have another seven minutes. I was remiss somewhat in the first round, so I will be letting everyone know it is exactly seven minutes and I will interrupt as we get close to that time frame. Um, Rebecca Miele, will you please start with your closing remarks? Yeah, absolutely. What I wanted, I, I, don't, I don't need like seven minutes, is I, what I wanted to stress out is that <laughs> The, the pandemic is affecting jihadism and terrorism uh, and it will all over the next decade. And, it, and in this sense, it is both from an operational point of view and propagandistically point of view. Because the pandemic shows that the West it's, is weak, not weak in the, uh, in the sense of uh, the body of the people is weak. It's, the, their system are weak. And the crisis triggered by uh, COVID could increase uh, the ranks of those terror groups that are filling institutional gaps or feeling the inactivity and weakness of the governments. So at the same time, every type of, of terrorist group from ISIS to white supremacists have now realized how uh, the effectiveness, how it is effective uh, first of all, from a psychological point of view, uh, and this is all come from biological weapons. So a pandemic um, could be could be considered like a biological weapons because you need just one infected man to infect all others. Uh, a pathogen, uh, such uh, using a pathogen uh, as a weapon or attack or as a deterrent, uh, could represent a new weapon in the hands of all international crime and not think uh, just about COVID-19 because COVID-19 is, is characterized by 
great infectivity, but it's not as lethal as Ebola or smallpox. What would happen with a virus with very high mortality rate? So um, what I think it's, it's important uh, looking at uh, the terror group is that they are exploiting the situation uh, in, uh, in many sense psychological, uh, operationally, and also, and this is the worst case, and this is the worst case scenario, uh, um, realizing how a, go a global pandemic could be destructive and how biological weapon could be uh, destructive as well. Uh, and that's it, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a critically important point that frankly, the press is not covering you know, all that much. So, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Mr. Rizvi, would you also be able to do closing statements? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I almost did my closing statements in my opening address, but uh, why not? So the, the thing is, overall, talking about the whole world, and I would say that this disease, after the introduction of this coronavirus into this complex system of countries and governments, governments and everything, I see that everything from the way that we work, from the way that we perceive things, from the way our, we hold our relationships with each other, with, each, uh, with, with, with the other countries, with the other governments, all of these things, all of the industries, everything is going to change. And what, is, what can make the matters worse is, once again, I'll repeat, is the current unfolding policy crisis that is happening around the world. Leader, I think, I believe that if I am to give a message or if I am to conclude something, I, I'd say that leaders around the world, they have a very serious uh, responsibility and a serious responsibility and a, and a duty that they should be able to pull, pull, you know, to show some resilience and they should be able to hold things together. Otherwise, with the way the things are going, right, going are these days, uh, that the trade wars, this, that is in the economic uh, realm, the geopolitics, that is in the international security uh, domain, and the overall, uh, the, the, the overall attitudes of the people, that is in the social and the uh, general domain. These are, all of these things will make matters, if not worse, then really, really difficult for the coming leaders, for the coming statesmen, for the coming people uh, to organize and bring them back to normal. So this is the time that we need the best policies, the most inclusive, the most pluralistic policies, uh, peaceful, appeasing policies to be introduced all around the world in every country and among the nations so that we can weather the storm together. That's good advice. Maybe you could talk to all of our leaders and let them know. That would be very <laughs> helpful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Alinas, would you please complete your concluding remarks? I think you're, you're muted, sir. I'm muted, okay. There you are. <laughs> I'm okay now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Now we can. Okay. So basically, I don't come back to the points I made earlier on, but um, in the ISMED, um, ever since the discovery of gas, everybody thought that they would be exporting gas and becoming very rich. A lot of aspirations have been built on this, uh, on this resource that will suddenly come and the economies of Cyprus, of, of uh, Lebanon and other countries in the region will suddenly uh, mushroom and benefit from gas. The opportunity was there for uh, 10, 15 years now. Sadly, that opportunity has gone. The, the, the world has moved in a different direction. The, the world is going green gradually. So there is more energy uh, absorbed by renewables and less by oil and gas. That means that the world is always, from now on, will always have too much oil and too much gas that it cannot use. And in fact, uh, you probably heard this before, Sheikh Yamani, the famous uh, Saudi oil minister, once said, the Stone Age did not run out because you ran out of stones. And the same will happen to the oil industry. It will not stop because we run out of oil. We run out of demand. Mm -hmm. this, is what the world is, uh, this is what is happening. The demand for oil and gas is becoming less and there is too much oil and too much gas chasing it. 
Now, developing the sea smelt gas in very deep waters is very expensive. So the price needed, the prices in the global markets needed to develop this gas are not there anymore. So we're not going to be able to sell that much of it. As a result, we have to start looking at using this gas locally. We also have to, lose, to look at other ways of improving the columns of the region, not just hoping that this gas is going to come and solve the problems. We have to find other ways to solve our problems and um, use the gas in the, uh, domestically in the region, combine it with renewables and make, ma make maximum use of that. Otherwise, if we don't, it's going to stay where it is, at the bottom of the sea. So, um, and also these regional conflicts, continuous problems between the countries of the region, especially between Turkey and most all of, the, all of its neighbors, unless we resolve these uh, disputes, we are not going to maximize use of these um, offshore resources. We need to resolve these disputes. We need to find ways to do it. That's why I suggested that perhaps Greece and Turkey can take the lead. If they find a way to uh, resolve their own problems, then it might help everybody else. Uh, but the future for Eastman Gas is local and regional markets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Grievous, can you please give us your closing statement as well? Yes, I would like to comment uh, something very important that uh, Dr. Mieli said. Uh, she said that uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, issue uh, has created uh, a very negative uh, <clears throat> image for the West, uh, that uh, the West is weak. This is something uh, of extreme importance, in my opinion. Uh, actually, the, the coronavirus functioned as the, the equivalent of a nuclear attack in the soft power of the, of the Western world. Uh, this uh, mythical element of the, of the Western power uh, suffered, uh, suffered something very, very uh, serious. So we, we saw uh, very uh, important countries, rich countries, uh, extreme technological advanced countries such as United States, or countries of the European Union that they had not uh, not even sufficient uh, masks for uh, uh, their uh, people in, in uh, the hospitals. Uh, or worse, we saw governments such as the one in Spain that actually uh, did not work uh, at all. They did not uh, uh, nothing at all in order to to prepare the country for uh, for uh, the attack of uh, of the coronavirus. This is something that uh, I think that in, in the long run uh, will have uh, uh, very dramatic uh, consequences in the form of the, the global system because uh, the, uh, at the, uh, the east side of, of Eurasia we saw not only the autocratic China but also democratic regimes such as uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Taiwan or uh, Singapore to, to have a, a much more uh, efficient uh, strategy uh, regarding how to deal with uh, the coronavirus. So uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this deconstruction of the image of the icon of, uh, of the West and uh, the, loss, the loss of face, the, the destruction of, of a great element of the, of the soft power of the West, I think that is also a very important factor that is going to, to, to accelerate this uh, transformation of the global system towards or uh, an, uh, towards an, an, an expanded uh, multipolarity or I think towards a, a new kind of bipolarity. That's all. Yeah, very interesting and good quote. The, uh, nuclear attack against the soft power of the West. I, I, we'll, we'll be quoting you. Um, I, I want to thank all the panelists. I want to thank the organization as well. It was extremely informative to me, and I, and I appreciate all of you sharing your time, and I appreciate being part of it. I will hand the floor back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Lisa Ruth. Thank you very much, everybody. As uh, I 
Yes, I wish before this uh, e-forum, uh, these two days, I wish everybody productively uh, a forum. That was uh, beyond of our expectation, I think. Uh, and um, these results you will receive uh, to with the link. You can you can keep this uh, forum. Uh, you can watch again in uh, YouTube. Uh, really, thank you very much, all. I appreciate your uh, your th this teamwork because. Uh, it's, uh, it's your work, and thank you very much, your participation. Uh, and uh, before we will close, I would like to ask something to every, each of the, speaker, of the speakers, but from a different perspective before we will close. And also thank you the, the participants here, our friends and our members that are follow us the last, uh, these two days. I would like to ask uh, everybody, but uh, Mr. Elinas, I want to uh, answer my question from the business perspective. Mr. Uh, Ms. Mieli, from a uh, uh, terrorist perspective. Mr. Grivas, the, the whole Mediterranean, uh, focus to the Mediterranean area, region. And Mr. Rizvi, from the perspective of uh, the prices of oil. My question is that, after one scenario, it's a very possible scenario. Uh, one scenario is that Libya maybe is the next, let's say, Syria. All right? So, uh, in this case, what means that for uh, business, Mr. Uh, Elinas? What means that for terrorism, Ms. Mieli? For Mediterranean, Ms. Rivas, and for oil and uh, mar gas markets, for energy markets, Ms. Rizvi. Focus on Libya, the future in the region that uh, affects not only uh, it's a, it's the center of gravity now, and the, after let's say post-COVID scenario, because we see in the latest uh, news that uh, United States involved. Uh, powers like uh, region powers like Turkey and of course Russia and China of course uh, with who they invest for several reasons in uh, Africa and uh, specific in North Africa so please you have a few minutes few words for this issue thank you very much again and uh, thank you our moderator uh, Miss um, Lisa Ruth I hope and I wish to, to continue this um, endeavor and to have uh, better and more relations together. Thank you very much. So the floor is yours. Thank you. First, Mr. Elias. Okay, so from the business point of view, I'm afraid the, the news is sad. It would not have much of an impact. I mean, Libya has not been producing much oil and gas recently. And if it stops producing because there is a a, a war or a problem, it really won't impact anything. It will uh, have little impact on the ISMED and little impact on the global oil and gas markets because of the fact, as I said before, that the world is oversupplied with oil and oversupplied with gas. Uh, a bit of a loss from Libya, it's going to have uh, a little impact. So the loss will be to Libya itself. Um, that some of the gas uh, goes to Italy and uh, that may not be continuing, but it's not essential to Italy. It can replace it with other gas. So the impact is small. Right. Ms. Bielli, what's the perspective uh, for terrorism in Libya? Uh, we focus uh, on Libya. Uh, Libya is one of the most unstable country uh, in the northern Africa, I think, and all over the world. So uh, what, I what I was saying before is that uh, terrorism uh, will probably uh, use the, the pandemia um, to uh, uh, stress out a situation that is the more is in crisis, the more it will get worse. 
So if Libya is one of the most unstable uh, uh, country from all point of views, uh, political, um, from security perspective, in uh, geostrategic alliances, uh, I think that terrorism uh, uh, will took uh, uh, the chance to to, to grow up. Uh, in a context, in a context with so uh, where the crisis is is day to day, it's growing up day to day. So this this is my point. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Grivas. What's your point of view? Actually, no. I will. I will. I will. Uh, let uh, Mr. Rizvi uh, to to uh, answer this. Uh, the the perspective in the uh, energy market. What means uh, a war in Libya? What means for the energy market? Yeah, so, energy. you know, fixed, yeah, right? not even for not only for energy, but for every other market or any other economic activity uh, for any given country, uh, there needs to be what is called a narrow corridor. You know, the country needs to be in that certain corridor, uh, which which means that their security their economic and their political policies are in such a harmony that they move in a certain direction. Obviously, they, we, we can't go in the, in the detail of that direction, but I don't see Libya as a country right now, as uh, one of the panelists said, that it is quite unstable. And until or unless that the country becomes politically stable, uh, I don't see much prospects for them, uh, you know, not only in energy markets, but in any other market as well. For it to, for it to, you know, take advantage of the changing world, or for it to take advantage of the lower oil prices, for, for instance, or this current uh, post-COVID-19 world, they need to have a certain amount of stability in their politics and in their society uh, to function properly. But uh, until or unless that happens, I don't see, you know, I don't see quite positive prospects for them in the future. All right, thank you, Mr. Rizvi. Mr. Mr. Grievous, what means for uh, Greece, and uh, especially for the Mediterranean? I'm saying Greeks because the half of Mediterranean, also, we can say that it's affected by Greek interests. But what yeah. means for Mediterranean, uh, the war in Libya? First of all, I think that the, the situation uh, is going to continue that way. It would be extremely difficult for any any part of the conflict to to achieve uh, a total victory. Uh, this is uh, because of the, the tribal uh, nature of uh, of Libya, which is a, a very difficult obstacle to, uh, obstacle to overpass in order to. Uh, to exercise full control of the country. So the situation is going, I think that it's going to continue uh, that way. Uh, this intervention, the Western intervention to, to Libya, I think that it was one of the most uh, unwise decisions ever made uh, uh, by Europe and by the United States. Uh, also, the, the, the whole uh, this whole uh, pink dream of uh, uh, Ara Arabian uh, Arabian Spring it was uh, it was an illusion as very wisely my my professor Yanis Maz said at the time that this Arab Spring it was a matter of time to be transformed to an Islamist uh, winter and we saw it uh, right now the destruction of Libya, of the Gaddafi regime actually, uh, among other things, uh, produced uh, a breach in the stability ring around Europe, which among other things uh, permits uh, the entrance of uh, uh, masses of uh, uh, illegal immigrants from, uh, from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which is a, a very, very important issue for uh, uh, for Europe uh, generally, and uh, I, as we see, uh, Turkey uh, uses uh, the a part of uh, of the, the, the Libyan uh, li leadership in order to to promote uh, her uh, imperialist uh, strategy in uh, the the East Mediterranean. 
So this uh, axis between uh, the government of uh, Tripoli and, uh, and Turkey, uh, it will be one of the, the major uh, uh, concerns for our uh, foreign policy, geopolitical strategy and military strategy in the near term uh, future. Perhaps even in this uh, summer we will have uh, some uh, very negative uh, uh, developments in, uh, in this area. Well, hopefully uh, to avoid it, but I think uh, we are in a very fragile situation. So, so as I can understand, you assess that this uh, summer will be very hot. Besides it's the weather in, in, in Greece now, it's, it's raining, but, uh, the, but you think that you assess that it will be very hot, right? It's a, it's a common sense in, in Athens. Uh, everybody expects uh, something uh, very troublesome between uh, Greece and Turkey. However, uh, uh, Ankara has uh, the initiative, so we have to, to wait All to right. see what is going to happen. I, actually, I agree about that. And uh, yes, this, this, this uh, uh, let's say, post COVID. Uh, 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 assessment, but like you said before, uh, in the hot summer, uh, yes, I believe that will be a very hot summer for the region of Mediterranean. Uh, I, I, me, I, I cannot, I, I'm not seeing now uh, questions in the chat, so just I will, uh, before I will pass the, the floor again to our moderator, I would allow me to read some comments in the chat, and uh, Mr. Aigun, our yesterday's speaker, and thank you very much again, Mr. Agun, uh, wrote something and let, allowed me to, to read. Mr. Elena, when for presentation, I had written an article for the Republica 34 years ago, exactly the same arguments that this net gas could create uh, independence and simulate political solutions to Cyprus too. Mr. Grivas, you spoke exactly the same ways as a Turkish president, who breaks on a conflict rather than a peaceful unpredictable crisis he asked, and if you, you can follow the group chat, uh, we need the people like Mr. Papandreou. No, Mr. Aigun, believe me, we don't need people like Mr. Papandreou. And uh, Mr. Green to build bridges rather than build the uh, trenches. Dr. Samieli, grazie Aguri, your observation were supposed to show the balance, understanding of all sides. Thank you very much, Mr. Aigun. Ms. Ruth, the, the floor is yours. And it's time to close uh, for well, Again, thank you all very much. It was a wonderful event. Thank you for including me. I'd like to remind everyone to please stay tuned and join AHEPA, HJ41, Calamaria and Mediterranean Council and Forum at AHEPAHJ41 at gmail.com. Uh, this is a wonderful event. I hope everyone participates in the next one. I hope you have a next one soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Πώς θα δείξω να με ακούς. Σε ακούω, Ανδρέ. Ωραία, από ό,τι βλέπω ο κόσμος αποχωρεί σιγά σιγά. Ναι. Ε, και εγώ σε ακούω. Να κλείσω το Ελπίζω... recording.